In this diagram, I have represented the activities using these edges. The arrows shows which direction the activity proceeds in on this diagram. The nodes, or the vertices, are representing the events, that is, moments in time when activities that feed into that moment in time have been completed. In each of the boxes that are next to the nodes, we are going to be representing the earliest time we can be at that event and the latest time that we can be at that event. The letters are representing the name of the activity and the number in brackets is representing the duration of that activity, so for hours, for days, whatever it might be. In order to work through this, I'm going to work through the nodes in numerical order. In an exam situation, it's highly likely that they will be numbered in such a manner as to help you, so it's a good premise to start in that way. However, the real thing is that you need to make sure that you are including all activities that feed into a particular node. Doing node 3 before you do node 1 would be very challenging, because in order to be at node 3, activity A and activity D must both be complete, and we can't know when we're going to do activity D since we haven't worked out anything about node 1. So just make sure you're doing it in the right order. Starting at node 0, of course, the earliest time that we can start our project, we're going to say is at time 0. We then look at node 1. This is the only edge which is going into node 1, or the only activity. So obviously, to be at that node, we need all activities to be done that feed into it, and so the earliest time we can be at node 1 is time 3. Going on to node 2, we can see that we have two now that feed into it, if we go from node 1 to node 2, we're at node 1 at time 3. The dummy activity, represented by the dotted line, adds 0 to that, so we could be at node 2 at time 3. But going along the C activity means that we would need to be there at time 5. We're looking for the earliest time we can be at the node, with all activities complete that need to be done to get to that event. The earliest time for everything that feeds in to be complete is 5. 5 is bigger than 3. Remember that the event represents the time when all activities that feed into it have been completed. So we need to look at the largest value. So we put a 5 in that point. Going now to node 3, we have got the A activity takes us to a time of 4. The D activity, well that's coming from node 1, so 3 plus 2 we would be there at time 5. So the earliest time we can be at node 3 is time 5, in order to have all of the activities complete. Node 4 has F and G going into it. F would be the time from node 1, which is 3 plus 2 is 5. And the time from G is from node 2. 5 plus the duration of G being 2 is 7. We need the larger of those values. So obviously 7 is the earliest event time for node 4. Node 5 has two activities going into it, so we're going to do 5 plus 8 is 13, 7 plus 4 is 11, we want the bigger of those, so 13 is the time there. Node 6 has J and H going into it, 7 plus 2 is 9, 5 plus 3 is 8, 9 is the larger one. Node 7 has K and M going into it, we want the time from node 4 which is 7 plus K is 7, so 14, or 9, the earliest time to be at node 6, plus 3 is 12. The larger value is 14. And finally, we have node 8. 14 plus 3 is 17. 13 plus 9 is 22. The larger of those two is 22. So now we know that the shortest time that we could complete this whole activity network is a time of 22. We're now going to do a backwards pass, that is starting at node 8 and ending at node 0 to find the latest event time, which is going to go into those bottom boxes. Since we know that we can get to 8 at time 22, it makes sense to have 22 as the late event time there. We don't really want to take any longer than the minimum amount of time to complete the job, so these two should always be the same. 
Now it's worth me saying at this point that node 0 should always have a 0 in that bottom box as well, but don't write it in at this stage. Use the method of going back through with this backwards pass, and hopefully you should end up with a 0 at that point, so it's a good way of checking your working as you're going. If you've got a 0 there, everything is hopefully fine. If you don't get a 0 there, you know you've made a mistake. So looking at node 7, we look at the activities that come out of it. We know that we need to be at node 8 for 22. I'm looking at the lower box there. And n takes 3 to complete it. This means that we could be at 7 at time 19. What we are saying there is that we could start n at any time up to including 19, and we would not make the total time of the project take any longer. We could start at time 19 and finish at 22. We could start n at time 18 and finish at 21. That doesn't mean we can complete the whole job at time 21, because we still need to do L, and L is what's causing it to take up to time 22. But that N could be moved a little bit if that helps our scheduling. We now go to node 6, and the only one coming out of that is M. We now know that we could be at node 7 at time 19 at the latest. M takes 3, so the latest that we could be at node C is, of course, 16. 5 also only has one coming out of it, so we're going to do 22 minus the 9, and we're going to put 13 in that position. When we get to node 4, we notice that there are 3 coming out of it. So here, looking at activity i, we could go time 13 from node 5, minus 4 is 9. We could use activity k and go 19 minus 7 is 12. Or looking at activity j, we've got 16 minus 2 is 14. Our latest event time then is 9. That's coming from the 13 minus 4. What we are saying is that we want the latest time where we can complete all of the jobs necessary to get us to the other late event times. If we're any later than time 9, we're not going to get i done in time to get to 13. But if we started k at time 9, that would be all right, because that would take us to 16, which is within the bounds for event at node 7. That's absolutely fine. If we started j at time 9, that would take us to 11 as our time. That's absolutely fine as well. It's within the bounds of the early and late event times at node 6. But it is crucial that we get along activity i at a latest time of 9 if we're going to complete the whole process in 22. Node 3 has just one coming out of it. We need to get to node 5 at 13, so 13 minus 8 is simply 5. Node 2 has two coming out of it, the G and H. So again, looking at the late event time for node 4, 9, take away the duration of G, which is 2, giving us 7. 9 take away 2 is 7. And looking at H, we've got 16, which is the late event time for node 6. 16 take away 3 is 13. We want the smallest value, so we're going to do 9 take away 2 is 7. Doesn't matter if we start h at time 7, we're still going to complete it within the times that's available at node 6. Node 1 has 3 coming out of it. We're going to do 5 take away 2 for d, giving us 3. 9 take away 2 is 7 for f. And 7 take away 0 for the dummy, which is going to give us 7. And of course we want the lower one. Node 0 has 3 coming out of it. Going down A, B, C, we've got 5 take away 4 is 1. 3 take away 3 is 0. And 7 take away 5 is 2. Of course, the lowest of those is 0, which is what we expected. So we've completed our backwards pass, and we've now got the early and late event times for each of those events. Now we're going to work out the float for each of the activities. It doesn't matter which order you do these in, I'm going to do them in alphabetical order. So to do this, for each activity, we're going to do the late event time of its finishing node, minus the early event time for its starting node, minus the duration of the activity. So starting with activity A, we have a 5, note that it's the bottom 5 we're actually looking at there, take away 0, that's the top 0, Take away 4, so as I say, the late event time of its finish node, node 3, 
minus the early event time of its starting node, node 0, minus the duration, 4. So obviously we've got 5 take away 0, take away 4, gives us a float of 1. For B, we're going to do 3, take away 0, take away 3, gives us a float of 0. For C, 7, take away 0, take away 5, float of 2. D, 5, take away 3, take away 2 is 0. E, 13, take away 5, take away 8 is 0. F, 9, take away 3, take away 2 is 4. G, 9, take 5, take 2 is 2. H, 16, minus 5, minus 3 is 8. For I, 13, take away 7, take away 4 is 2. J is 7. K is 5. L is 0. M is 7. And finally, N is 5. And there we've got the floats of each of those different activities. The float, of course, tells us by how much we can shift an activity and still get to the completion time of 22. For example, that activity F has a float of 4. We can move that activity, if the units are hours, we can move it by 4 hours at start and, and finish time, and we're going to be OK. We can still complete the job at time 22. However, activity E has a float of 0. We cannot move that at all. It absolutely has to happen at that critical time. And what we're going to do now is look at those critical activities. These are the activities with a float of 0. What we need to do is find a path that goes from our start node, node 0, to our finish node, node 8, or sometimes called the source node to the sync node, finding a path that goes exclusively through zeros. Now, this doesn't necessarily include all zeros that are on your diagram. In this particular case, it does, though. We can go from node 0 to 1, to 3, to 5, to 8, and this tells us that our critical activities are B, D, E, and L. These are all of the activities that must be completed at very specific times if we are to complete it at time 22. If for some reason we need to change the timings of those, it is going to have a knock-on effect and make the project take more than 22. The process of finding a critical path is quite long and involved, and there are lots of numbers to be inserted into the diagram, and there is the capacity for making mistakes. Take it very carefully. Make sure you know whether you're looking for the largest comparative value or the smallest comparative value. Make sure you work very methodically through these problems. I wish you good luck. Thank you.